Hello and welcome to Octacon Presents. We can change faster than the climate can. Tonight, we'll be discussing climate change, people change, and a belief in the collective power of humanity. With Ashin Megan, author of the new book, A Short, Hopeful Guide to Climate Change. I'm your host, Daniela Bella, a disabled LGBTQIA plus activist and organizer and longtime Octacon member. Oshin is the author of such books as The Gods and Their Machines, Race the Atlantic Wind, and The Mad Grandad series, among many other works of fiction. But his new book is a non-fiction guide to climate change and the environment in general in a way that's accessible to both teenagers as well as adults, and I would argue it's accessible to a lot of younger kids too. Um, So... If you think of anything you would like to ask Oshin, please drop a question in the chat. And without further ado, Oshin, welcome to Octagon Presents. Thanks very much. Thanks for having me. Um, so to start off, Oshin, um, would you mind telling us about where you grew up? Um, all right. Um, I was I grew up my first six or seven years in Dublin, and then we moved to Drogheda, um, and. Uh, we, um, I went to a, a Church of Ireland school, so um, I was kind of one of the few non-Catholics in the town, I think. Um, and uh, yeah, we grew up on the edge of the town, so I would go, we, we spent more time out in the countryside than we did in the town itself when we were kids. And it was also kind of during the recession, and it was, the place was a building site that was half-finished houses everywhere, so um, brilliant for kids. Like, uh, you know, half-finished houses are climbing frames, and so are kind of parked construction vehicles. Um, so that was kind of where we grew up, a nightmare for parents. Um, so, yeah, so kind of good, like a, a physical um, upbringing. And then um, I went to secondary school in St. Oliver's, um, which is a um, community college. And, um, and I was writing the whole time. I, I started off when I was very young. I started writing about six or seven. And I would fill a couple of books with stories. And then I would... Um, because I was so young when I started off, everything was illustrated. So I thought if you're going to write stories, you had to, you had to draw illustrations with them as well. Um, so I would fill copy books with um, uh, stories and illustrations. And a lot of it was like when I started off, it would be copying. So there was like Buck Rogers and Star Wars and, and all sorts of stuff. And then Transformers and, um, and you kind of copy, you know, it's fan fiction, basically you're writing, um, into the worlds that that entertain you and then um and then mixing in your own stuff as well so um and i never quit that i never gave up the whole kind of writing goth books and then in secondary school like i was kind of more big into comics and um they were having a bigger influence on me but i was just a voracious reader i mean and you know once you're kind of around 11 or 12 you're you're um you're kind of you read you're almost reading adult stuff already so i'm actually reading my daughter's board ship down at the moment and haven't read that since i was a kid and i'm just oh, so no. so kind of relieved that they're enjoying it because it was oh, so, kind yeah. of one of those big things in my life so um so yeah it was, it, it was there was always stories but there was a point where i thought i didn't know anybody who wrote for a living i didn't know anybody who drew for a living um these were people kind of they were off in the distance uh they were dead <laughs> half of them um yeah. and uh, so I didn't know, and I just kind of felt I had to have a proper job and I was kind of, I liked science, but I wasn't sure what type of science I liked. Yeah. Um, so for a while I, I got interested in zoology and I thought that's what I'm going to be. Um, and w- was taking it fairly seriously until about, uh, basically until I did the intersert and I did art in the intersert and I hadn't done any art classes, but back then you could, you could just do the exam by, by, by drawing and painting. Mm-hmm. Um, so, uh, and I got an A in it and I thought, okay, I, I really enjoyed the exam. I thought, you're not supposed to enjoy this stuff. Who, who enjoys their intercert? So, right. um, and that was kind of like when I got my results from that and I kind of really started thinking about what, what do I really want to do? And I really wanted to do, at the time it was comics. I wanted to do comics and I thought, well, I'm writing illustrate. I have no idea how you get into writing. So I'm going to kind of go for illustration. And that was it was a fairly quick decision, a fairly quick turnaround, because I'd never quite given up on the idea of writing and illustrating, but it just couldn't figure out how it worked. How did you do it? You know, how did you get into the, the job doing it? Um, so for fifth and sixth year, I that was kind of what was named for my academic um, record suffered as a result, um, yep. because, and then I got into art college before I got my leaving cert, I got a place in Valley Furman. And with don't, don't do that. Um, <laughs> because all of a sudden I chilled out just before my leaving cert. 
Um, but uh, yeah, so then it kind of it ended up working out. But it was um, uh, I was just passionate about writing and drawing, and it, I just um, I would just do it whenever I got the chance. Um, and you know, things like 2000 AD and Battle Action Force were the comics I read, and then um on all sorts of I mean, any any kind of books really uh cold war thrillers for a while um a lot of science fiction and fantasy um i mean it, it's probably the same for a lot of people online here there's a lot of the same books but um yeah yeah so that was kind of uh, once I, I felt like i was unhooked you know once i realized no this is what i want to do that's it i don't yeah. care what happens now i know i know what i'm going for um and it kind of made, and then so I went on to art college from there. So, um, and dropped out because I wasn't getting enough out of it. I just, you know, I wanted to get straight into the work. So, um, so yeah, it's, it's, and since then have had a really interesting CV because it just, you know, you try, you drop out of art college, you're not going to have a normal career. You know, that's it. You kind of committed to a weird, a weird way of life, really. Um, well, had, had you heard about, when, when was the first time you, you remember hearing about climate change was it was it um it was probably global warming right um, um yeah and it was i think uh i mean i would have been aware of it when when it started making headlines and that would have been back late 80s yeah um, and it always kind of had an interest in climate change or in the environment sorry uh, but i wasn't um I wasn't as involved as I thought it was going to be. So for instance, even though I was big into kind of being really interested in animals for, I wasn't writing stories about animals. Um, yeah. So it was, you know, like to, when I, when I first read Watership Down, for instance, just because it's current at the moment, um, I remember reading this, there's like dozens and dozens of plant names that kind of come up in the book as you're describing the environment. And I remember thinking when I was a kid, when I'm older, I'll know what all these are, yeah. you know, because grownups will know about this stuff. Yeah. Um, and actually, unless you're kind of growing up in that environment and soaking it all in or studying botany, a lot of this stuff you're just unaware of. So, mm -hmm. um, so yeah, it was global warming was was I was conscious of it, but it was a theoretical thing. I really didn't get my head around it. And it was only kind of later on um, the first the first time it started influencing my work really was. Um, Actually, no, I was going to say I was going to say something else, but actually my first book, The Harvest Eye Project, the first novel, is it's a full-on fantasy novel, but yeah. it's actually more of a kind of a, an ecology. I didn't want a book about magic, but I did want a lot of weird stuff. Mm. Um, and it was kind of really wanted to unleash the imagination and let it rip. Um, so it's about a strange ecology, and it's actually about an ecological disaster. And I kind of, it must have been in there, because when I look back and going, all right, so actually I can see, you know, there's a... Uh -huh. There's a connection there. But actually, when I started thinking consciously about it, I'd written, I was writing a book called Small Minded Giants. Yeah. And that's actually set in a frozen world where our Earth freezes over. And I knew that this was not, you know, where we were headed. So, yeah. but it's, I needed that to happen for the story because that was about a contained world where everything they have left, that's it. They have no more resources, they have no more new resources. So everything is about recycling heat, generating heat in this frozen world every material they have is, is, is only, you know, it's going to run out. So even kind of being conscious of how much wear on the soles of your shoes you're losing. Um, and that was kind of very much about resources and also about society kind of looking after each other. Um, and very much kind of, kind of the, the ordinary people in society making everything work, that people just doing, living their normal lives was what made things work. So that was kind of um, a big influence on that book. But a little after that, uh, um, or the first time I should say that kind of I started working directly on, it, on something to do with climate change was I, I started a residency in 2014. <clears throat> and that was, um, there were five different writers from five different countries. And we were uh, um, basically tasked with um, exploring climate change through storytelling. Right. Um, so that was... Uh, and there were there was, there was somebody from Germany, Poland, UK, and uh, Australia. It was it was an, it was funded by the EU Culture Fund, but they always bring one country in, for, or you can bring one country in from outside. So yeah. that was kind of the first time, and that that was pretty serious because we then really had to kind of learn about this subject and take in what was happening and think about how do we find different ways of getting people's attention or spreading that message. So uh, it was very much an experiment, but we produced a lot of work for it, and part of that involved working with. Uh, 
an arts organization and three, uh, well, we all had to work with schools, but I was working with three schools in Tala. Yeah. Um, and that was really when things switched for me. That was when I started to really pay attention to what was happening. Did you find that just like being around kids and their curiosity around about, about the environment was like, did, did that influence like the direction of travel for how you got thinking <laughs> about environmentalism? Um, I, I don't think so, not necessarily. I think I had already been, I'd been working in schools for a long time. I, I, from, I was first published, I got my first book published, I should say. I've been published as an illustrator for a long time, but I got my first book published in 2003. And one of the things in children's books is um, that you end up, you do a lot of children's events. You're, you're basically expected to go out and help sell the book. Um, and I just figured I am going to do whatever it takes to get my books out there. So I started to be taking a lot of children's events. And then as part of that, I got involved with an organization, organization called Poetry Ireland, who are basically like Literature Ireland. They, um, but they run a thing called Writers in Schools, and that's where they send people into schools. So that, we have a great culture of that in Ireland. Um, but they also have a thing called Development Education Residencies, and that means that you go in and you teach creative writing, but with a social justice theme. Right. Um, so the first ones I've done have been about child labor. Um, and the idea is not that you're giving loads of information, but that you're, you're trying to provoke empathy. So you're, you're getting the kids to think about somebody in that situation and write a story about somebody in that situation. Um, and so we did other things as well. We did hunger and we did fair trade. Um, but around the time I was actually taking on this big residency, um, they changed their system. So they were funded by what was then now like eventually called Irish Aid. And um, they said, right, from now on, you choose your own theme. So you pick what you want to do. <clears throat> and I had just finished um, or was just finishing my, uh, my residency with weather stations, which is the big one. Yeah. Um, and that was kind of a two year thing. And I said, well, I want to do climate change. I don't think there's, there's anything more important now. Um, and that was when I started doing these residencies in, in primary and secondary schools. Um, and the, my emphasis became not so much conveying loads of information because I don't think information has, has been the problem for a long time. It was engagement. So if you imagine my efforts were getting to write stories, but it was kind of 80% engagement, 20% information telling them about the subject and how to work it into stories. And by getting them to work it into stories and creating empathy with characters, um, making it personal, but really my, own, my, my only goal was to get them to pay attention when this stuff came on the radio or on the television or whatever. I just figured if I can get them to turn their heads when somebody is coming and talking about this on the radio, my job's done. You know, that's, that's the bit I have to look after. Yeah. So, um, and that was, you know, creating the access, getting them, getting that first bit of interest, getting them from not interested to interested. That was basically what I was aiming for. Um, so, yeah, so that was kind of my first, that was where they started kind of influencing the work. Yeah, I, I think, have, have you noticed a, a change in like the, the urgency of how, 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 how people are talking about climate change in that time? Oh, yeah. Definitely, yeah. definitely. I mean, even in the time that I've been in, kind of doing anything on this, um, it's gone from being, it was, I think kind of early 2000s, it was people were talking about it, but didn't relate it to their lives for a lot of the time. Um, yeah. Whereas now they are. Now people are saying, hang on a second, this is this is starting to kind of, you know, and then it's a lot of it's just do what we're seeing in the media. We're seeing kind of wildfires in, in California and Australia and down in Congo and, and places like that. We're seeing fires in a Siberia above, you know, above the Arctic Circle. Um, we're seeing, you know, every day now we're seeing kind of shots of glaciers, glaciers you know, ice sheets coming off Greenland. Yeah. But I think they're they're the big kind of they're the you know um, they're the Independence Day version of this. Um, yeah. Whereas there's an awful lot more kind of stuff happening as well. So, but I think people are starting much more to relate it to their normal lives. Um, and definitely a greater sense of urgency, but also I think this sense of this, it's kind of head wrecking. You can't get your head around it. As soon as you take an interest, you realize how big it is and go, Oh my God, this is, you know, you almost kind of shut down again. So. Yeah. I, I, I think that's kind of a common thing where like I noticed with a lot of like my friends, it's like even the ones who are like, who believe it's happening and something must be done. It's like, you know, well, what can we do in the face of, 
in the face of like you know a hundred companies who are um who are causing all this pollution and um and it's it's kind of it's it can be very hard to get anyone to engage even when they care about it yeah and i think <clears throat> on one hand we, we make a big thing about individual responsibility um which you know is is, is an issue but we also i think we that's we we tend to push too much on that and and not so much on the fact that well actually you know changing one policy can affect tens of thousands of lives as opposed to each person trying to do one little bit yeah. um <clears throat> and also we're i mean you know in terms of kind of left-wing politics or environmentalism we, we tend to be very self-critical and, and kind of um you know could be our own worst enemies at times but during this this weather stations residency it was a cultural fund so the idea was there was cultural exchange we had to travel to each other's countries as part of the program and it was one of these things where you have to tick a box for different types of funding and you had to kind of it all had to work out so we had to go to each other's countries and we went to i went to australia and i was really self-conscious about this because i'm thinking you know great i'm going to australia this is fantastic and i could spend three weeks learning about climate change but also um I'm, it, yeah. I'm flying to australia in a jet plane you know this is not <laughs> the kind of this is not exemplary behavior yeah. And I, I was, it was a bit wreck in my head as, as I was making the trip. But at one point, well, actually quite a little way through the trip, you know, you, the screens on the seats. Yeah. And they kept showing, um, because the United Arab Emirates was one of the places we stopped, we kept seeing property ads for the United Arab Emirates. Um, right. Emirates for, um, for skyscrapers, apartments yeah. and skyscrapers. And it kind of sank into me then, I thought, that's what we're up against. We're up against the yeah. kind of money that builds skyscrapers in a desert, you know. Yeah. So I thought, you know, I we've got to cut ourselves some slack here. You know, oh yes, I should. You know, there's I could be doing better things than flying in a plane, but we're up against the kind of money that builds oil rigs and oil tankers and yeah. drills into the bottom of the ocean. So right. I kind of thought, right, you know, we 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 really need to kind of kind of get our our priorities straight. Um, and it also kind of it also kind of puts things in perspective when you think about um, the power of messaging. You know, if, if uh, as I mentioned in the book, if if your company has the power to the money to kind of build um, a gas refinery rig that's the size of four aircraft carriers, what kind of money can it put into communication and changing the message? And um, you know, the, I'm very conscious of of you know the the potency of storytelling. But I also know how hard it is to get anything out there, you know, in terms of publishing and, and the kind of tiny money that we need to kind of get together to publish a book. Yeah. And at the same time, you know, somebody in an office somewhere in an oil company can just go, yeah, we're going to buy a magazine, you know, yeah. we're going to we're going to get a whole, <laughs> like, we, yeah, know, just, like a whole university it, wing um, yeah. to research our, our product. So, um, yeah, it, it's <laughs> it's kind of the scale of it's pretty um, daunting when you think about it. Yeah, just go down to the shops, pick up a magazine, like a whole company <laughs> while you're there. Yeah, yeah. Um, so is um so this new book, it's um a short hopeful guide to climate change. Could you? It's kind of a collaboration, I guess, with in in a sense with Friends of the Earth. Am I right in think in saying that? Yeah. Well, it was kind of um I'd been I'd been working on these residencies in schools, and I I kind of had played with the idea of doing a book but I hadn't done anything about it and I wasn't sure how to start and I was also really self-conscious because I'm not an expert in any of these areas I mean it's a, yeah. it covers a vast range um and I think sometimes that in itself has been an obstacle in terms of the experts like you know if your expert is climate if you're an expert in climate science you're not you might not want to kind of talk too much about glaciers or talk, talk about um, marine biology or so I think sometimes serious experts try to avoid stepping on each other's toes because they kind of that, that's not my, my my area and for that reason it's actually very hard to find somewhere that covers all the bases yeah. so I was kind of thinking and also does it in kind of an appealing way like an engaging way so I kept thinking, I kind of know what I'd like to do but I didn't want to be the one to, and then um, Little Island who are publishers and they were talking to friends of the earth and they said they'd like to do something for a kid, like a kid's book on it. Um, and uh, so they came to me and asked if I'd write it. And um, and we basically, we had one meeting and then we kind of agreed more or less what we wanted. We we're kind of slightly varied in terms of what our goals were for the book. Um, 
we all agreed kind of a, a, a base idea or foundation. And then I went off and wrote it and they kind of had to research it. So, um, <clears throat> so the Friends of the Earth weren't that involved at that early stage. Um, I do a lot of the research myself, but I really needed somebody to fact check me. Um, right. And it, I've never second guessed myself on a book the way I have on this one. So yeah. I, I was constantly thinking, God, if I, and also, you know, um, most of what, most of the basic facts haven't changed in a long time. I mean, things have got worse, yeah. <laughs> but they haven't, you know, they got more urgent, but they, the, the essentials have been the same, but there's new research coming out all the time. So I was, everything I would check, I'd have to go and check somewhere else, you know, and I, I kind of took the journalism approach of there have to be three sources for everything I say and for more, for the important stuff anyway. Um, and, uh, and I needed to, you know, I wanted to use decent sources. So that's why, um, uh, and I wanted to show that Haddon wasn't mm-hmm. going to be written like an academic book, but I wanted mm-hmm. to show. So I've given a list of some of my sources um, on my website and on the um, Little Island website, just as kind of say, here's further reading. If you want to read about any of these proper, you know, any of these subjects, you can go and check out other sources. Um, <clears throat> and I also say all the way through the book, check with the experts, listen to the experts. I'm not an expert on this stuff. Um, so the, um, yeah, so it was friends of the earth kind of um they came in and there was i don't know if you've ever seen them like an edited manuscript in word um I, but you know the way the different colors for different kind of inputs so mine yeah. like a rainbow and it was just like every everything was changed all you know so this constant back and forth trying to get everything straight mm-hmm. um to the the point where you just have to do a clean one every now and again, like just kind of, like there's just too many J's now. Yeah. So, um, so there was that, there was a lot of back and forth on that just because we wanted to kind of get it as, as straight as we could. But even then, like, I mean, a lot of the stuff, as I say, is, is kind of well-established, but um, there were tiny little things where I'd gonna go, oh, hang on, hang on, did I double check that one? Um, and I'd go back in. And then of course, like when I, when I read the book, finally, you kind know, of, when it was finally printed, um, I still found a bloody mistake in it, or like when yeah. I was reading. So, um, <clears throat> but yeah, so it was the idea with the book was um, well, there were three three things that I wanted to do, and the delivery of information again was not the first priority. Okay. Um, although I wanted to cover all the basics, and actually, I in all my reading, I didn't find anything that covered all the all the basics there would be kind of an emphasis on the science or on the politics or on the kind of social justice issues wherever I looked, but there was nothing that kind of gave you a good kind of foundation of all of them. Um, <clears throat> so for my first priority was to make it personal so that people could relate their own lives to the things that were going on. And I, um, the second was to find a way to take all the basic principles of the subject and make, find the most compelling elements so that, you know, it wasn't always the most important thing. It had to be, a compelling thing as well because I wanted to be an interesting book you know um I wanted basically my my target audience was a 10 year old me you know kind of a nerdy 10 year old into the science kind of you know but still needs needs it you know to be accessible Mm -hmm. um and the third thing was I wanted to give it a narrative arc so that it would have a very clear beginning middle and end and there would be a sense of momentum so that you're reading through and you feel like you know it's carrying you through. So each thing had to, you know, had to lead into the next, yeah. um, starting with like literally the birth of the world, how our atmosphere changed, how humans appeared, you yeah. know, and it's very much about how our civilization and, and the environment are woven together. You know, they're not separate things. And that, that mm-hmm. comes through all the time. Um, mm-hmm. <clears throat> so, um, and I really wanted that sense of like, this isn't, this hasn't just happened because I think sometimes um you know with with Greta Thunberg and some of the big protests I think a lot of young people feel like this has just landed on them um it's just landed and now we have to do something about it um when in fact actually people have been doing something about it for a very long time you're you're getting on a moving train you know this has not just happened um and granted we need to be kind of changing things faster but it's a natural progress that has been happening all the time so yeah um and uh, yeah, yeah. So that for me was one of the big issues about one of the big kind of means of giving hope was the sense that this, you know, you're not you're not expected to go out and save the glaciers. You know, it's um, it's very much part of a bigger system that we're all part of. Would you would you be able to read a little bit from the book for us? <laughs> yeah. So um, I'm just going to read the, the introduction. I think it's a good way to start. 
Um, That'll be fantastic. So um, and the, the introduction is why this matters to you. Um, sorry, I'm just going to grab some water. All right. Um, <coughs> go ahead. Okay. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, we live in a world where humans can land a spacecraft on a comet, which is like trying to land a speeding bullet on another speeding bullet, only many times harder. Though I'm not a scientist, I'm a fan of science. To me, it is magic, but in real life. And what I am most interested in is that contact point where science meets human nature. Because humans are, well, you know, weird. And while this book is about climate change, it's about our human story too. All the acts of brilliance and absurdity that got us here and where we're off to next. I want to share my sense of wonder at our existence. We're the species that invented cheese and nuclear weapons. We created the internet and then used it to post cat videos. We're living on a planet that is a freak oddity in our galaxy and you are completely woven into it. Your environment is everything beyond your flesh. It immerses you in its protective atmosphere, presses its air against your skin, it fills your lungs. Your body is built out of the air you breathe and the food and drink you consume. Planet Earth is your life support system and you are permanently plugged into it. It may not surprise you to learn, but there's some really bad news in this book. There's just no denying that humans have messed things up in a big way. And yet within that mess lies hope for the future. Because a long time ago, we started out running evolution, racing ahead in the natural world, and it has led us to where we are now. Like a rocket leaving scorch marks and smoke behind it, we didn't pay enough attention to the damage we left in the wake of our progress, but we're paying attention now, now that we've become aware of our power. And to quote Spider-Man and lots of other people before him, with great power comes great responsibility. I'm not writing about climate change to inspire fear or guilt. No, I want to share my fascination with it. The changes that are happening around us are revealing how beautifully complex and interconnected our planet is. There is so much that is striking and strange and wild about it that no matter what your interests and passions are, there is something that will light your fire. And speaking of fire, we talk a lot about the negatives of fossil fuels and how they've affected our atmosphere, but we also have to appreciate what they have given us, the energy to create our advanced civilization. We wouldn't be where we are today without wood, peat, coal, gas, and oil. We can carry a million pages of text on a USB drive that fits on a key ring, transplant a new heart into a living human being, or film a giant squid at the bottom of the ocean. And all of which we can do because of the way that we have used the world's resources so far. And it's not just our science that has progressed over this time. We've developed as civilized beings too. As our world becomes more unified, more enlightened and better educated, we have established ideas like human rights, democracy, and the value of empathy. We're taking better care of each other. Our world is more peaceful than it has ever been. But we have burned our way to the top. Progress and pollution are twisted together in the story of the human race. Our development has come at a huge cost to the thin living skin wrapped around this ball of rock we call Earth. This is an issue that affects everyone, everywhere. But I live in Ireland and I'm conscious that there will be points in the book where I refer to things that we have. In other words, I'm referring to a normality that I live in that not all other people around the globe will share. Our world is an extraordinarily varied place. Though I write from my own experience of life, it's only one point of view. There are countless others with very different lives and experience and indeed many of the countries that are being affected most by climate change have contributed the least to its advance. Industrial development has caused this problem and then most developed nations, including mine, bear the greatest responsibility to do something about it. The most important thing I want you to take away from this book is that we are already transforming our civilization. Society is in a constant state of change and the same progress that has left its scorch marks on our environment is steadily carrying us away from our fossil fueled past. You cannot solve climate change all by yourself and nobody is expecting you to. Billions of people created this crisis over centuries through countless tiny actions, and so the sheer enormity of it can feel overwhelming. Throughout the book, I will describe the different changes taking place in our environment, and while it may feel as if the scale of these changes is beyond our power to overcome, you should always remember that humans caused them, and we did it by accident. Now, however, we are waking up to what we've done, and in the greatest moment ever seen in human civilization, people around the world are grasping the power that caused this. Through a myriad of small actions, they are re redirecting that power. No single person or organization or country can slow the changes in our climate, and yet billions of people taking tiny actions every day can do that and more, helping steer us towards becoming a wiser, healthier, more sustainable society. This is a big ship, but if we all contribute, if we all pull the same way, we can turn it around. 
It is an unprecedented situation and one I find both thrilling and inspiring. The human race in every country around the globe and at every level of society has begun to unite to take on a planet-sized problem. Climate change is a threat to everything we know, but the story of climate change is also the story of our civilization. It is an epic and fascinating tale about our success as a species, and it is ongoing. That story is carrying us into the future. We are gaining increasing foresight and exerting more control over our path to that distant horizon. And there are as many ways to get involved and help solve this as there are problems to solve. So as you read this book, always remember that the same mind boggling power that changed the climate on our planet by accident can also be used deliberately with compassion, intelligence and wisdom. That is our goal. It is an incredibly ambitious undertaking, and I believe that in making a better world, we will make our better, ourselves better human beings. I have great hope for the future we are creating for ourselves. So that's the introduction. Uh, that's a, kind of a beautiful and almost profound way to introduce somebody to, to the idea of the climate. Like it, it harkens back to like, who we are as a species as well as like as like uh, as as it it starts with us and it kind of works its way out to climate change in a way that's less like this is happening around you and this is this this is this is something that that's outside of our control like it's really cool but, I, I mean i think one of the one of the things that's, and this is kind of where the sci-fi crowd kind of probably get it a lot better than a lot of other people, but if you think about it, for the first time, probably, you know, ever, um, we are acting, we are, well, I should say, we are starting to act as a species for the good of our planet. Um, you know, we're, we're transcending national borders, continental borders, um, racial divisions, all of that. All of that has to be put aside. Um, and it's, it's, I mean, it's incredibly inspiring to see it. And it's slow because there's so many of us, you know, and there's so many different opinions and, and um, smaller kind of motives and goals. But there are, there are millions of people involved in this. And so it is going to happen slowly. But um, I'm trying to remember that there was a Neil Stevenson quote. Um, I think it was him anyway. <clears throat> where he was kind of describing how slow and awkward it was to turn an aircraft carrier around. Yeah. But he says, but once it's turned around, you have a fucking aircraft carrier. Yeah. Um, so <laughs> it, it's, it's kind of like that. Our civilization is this massive ship and it's going to, you know, if it, if it goes the wrong way, it's a bloody disaster, but you get it going the right way. And it is, it is something that's utterly, you know, it's, it's extraordinary. So, um, that's what I kind of wanted to get this sense across is that and, and towards the end of the book, you know, I talk not so much about the climate, but other things that we've done on big scale. And one of my really one of my stipulations on writing the book, one of my conditions on writing this book was that the the we had to give a sense that the resolutions were on the same scale as the problems. Um, so that, you know, we had to show, look, here are things that the human race has done on a massive scale. Um, and it's kind of like these were the practice run, you know, before we took on this thing. So um, there's a load of things at the back of the end of the book where we we took on the problems that couldn't have been solved if there wasn't huge numbers of people working to solve them. Uh, so, um, yeah, yeah, that's it. I think, I mean, there's, there's an awful lot of negative stuff. And for every single little thing in the book, I could find more negative points. Yeah. But I wanted to say, well, actually, look at the big picture, look at the momentum, the progress. Um, let's let's kind of you know let's exert our will on this um, yeah and the more people who kind of get involved the better the more people who kind of start even caring in some way and, and giving something some aspect of it their attention um you know the, the more we can kind of get things done um i i know there's um i can't remember who uh, came up with the idea but there's this idea that humankind when it, in the way that we work together is kind of like a human colossus and it's kind of like you know you are one cell in this human colossus and you need a lot of cells working together in order to like move an arm <laughs> yeah well i think there was a, there was a clive barker i don't know if it was a short story first or a comic story for us where these basically giants made out of people you know individual uh -huh. people and the angel would be like individuals were crushed and fell off and, and but you know <laughs> but the giants moved on 
and that there was some like kind of like towns gathered together and made these giants and kind of feel a bit like that sometimes so yeah um <laughs> so it's kind of you know it's everybody kind of choosing we have to go this way most of us have to decide on the same way we're not going to go anywhere so um so i think there, there's that aspect to it and i think you know um we see setbacks all the time but it's been really interesting because even in the last few months that i was writing the book and since the book was published i'm seeing more and more stuff of the sense of this like an increasing momentum um so i can't even the last week i'm just kind of remembering um there was a chevron and exxon mobil their their shareholders rebelled because they weren't moving doing enough on climate so now like those companies have people in on the boards saying no, no you've, you've actually we've had enough you can't keep doing this um shell lost a big court case in holland um bordemona have stopped mining peat um the two biggest manufacturers of coal-fired power stations have stopped they're after they finish their current projects they're no longer going to make coal-fired power stations so there's a sense of this stuff's really starting to happen and it's a lot of it's starting to happen because there's a there's an acknowledgement of the issue, but also a kind of people taking action in loads of different ways. And some of it is simply uh, like shareholders and companies saying, you know, I'm, I may not be the kind of boss of this company, but you still have to listen to me. I have shares in this company. Um, and like even things like hedge funds saying we're divesting from anything that has anything to do with fossil fuels, you know, and the, the only way to get these companies to behave is, is to cost them money. Um, so, um, you know, they may be a moral kind of big, monoliths but they're not you know they're, they're kind of run and fueled and paid for by people so the more people start kind of adding their weight to this the better um <clears throat> so it's yeah i mean it, it's it's a huge subject to cover so there wasn't i couldn't go into a lot of detail in any of the, the places but what i want was that, to give it a shape because i think one of the biggest problems is that it's amorphous it's kind of people can't get their heads around it there's too many different things going on and because of the way the media works and, and kind of on television or radio, we normally only hear about one thing at a time. And it's generally negative because that's the thing we need to hear about. So we don't get to see the story, the whole big story and how it's woven into our civilization. That, that's, we don't really have room for that kind of perspective most of the time. Your description of uh, like cyanobacteria farting out oxygen and transforming the atmosphere um, was, really, was really evocative and accessible. Um, was were there any concepts you found like really difficult to uh, to put into a, a way that that was accessible? Um, there were probably a bunch. I mean, I, I kind of my mind's gone back and forth over it for months, and um, uh, I don't know. You see, I was kind of thinking again. Engagement was such a big part of it that <clears throat> you're often spending quite a bit of t- like if you mind, it's only a forty five thousand word book. Um, and some of that is the boxes that the Friends of the Earth put in, like, separately. Um, so they're kind of just little practical hints on each chapter. <clears throat> so the the text doesn't have a lot of room, and a, some of that, a lot of the room had to be given over to telling it in a kind of in a, a colourful or appealing way. So um, you don't kind of, I didn't want a lot of densely packed facts. Um, <clears throat> so there are some, I mean, there are some things like... Um, trying to get the idea of thermohaline circulation across is, is tricky if you know yeah. if you never come across it before i mean it's a massive thing and it's very relevant to ireland um the idea of you know these massive currents being driven by salt and by um temperature um so you know some of those things that i suppose the more theoretical stuff the more distant stuff was very hard the idea of like our oceans have heated up by by nearly a degree which sounds tiny except for it's the oceans like it's the whole lot um so it's kind of trying to get the sense of scale sometimes and and i think sometimes that's one of the things that comes across as deceptive is when we're often talking about really small percentages you know i mean when we talk about one or two percent like restricting kind of we're, we're past one anyway so we're, we're heading for 1.5 and it could be a lot higher yeah. in terms of increase um so the, the IPCC have said, we're going to try and keep it under two, you know, it's like yeah. slightly <laughs> less disastrous. Um, sure. So, you know, as opposed to five, which would mean palm trees in the Arctic. Um, yeah. So um, it just like, you're trying to get these ideas of small, these small little changes and how big effect they have, or even kind of the, the way the oceans are more acidic 
and how that just affects the kind of the shells and the formation of, of kind of microorganisms. So all of these things, you're trying to kind of make the small changes and describe how dramatic they are um, and the effects they have. Um, so that trying to convey that stuff was really hard. And even something simple, like one of the things I, I keep coming back to is how thin our atmosphere is. Our atmosphere, our breathable atmosphere is like eight kilometers, yeah. which is nothing. I mean, it's like if you looked at a globe, it's like it's like the layer of, of kind of plastic going around the globe. You know, it's nothing. Um, so we tend to think we look up the sky that's endless. But of course, it's not. It's, it's really limited, um, which explains how we've been able to kind of affect it so, so fundamentally. Um. I really liked how you spent time on on like quite divisive issues in the environmental movement and you just sort of gave the bare facts and la- and kind of left it up to the reader to like work out what their position on it is like with like nuclear energy or with um uh, G- uh geoengineering and that kind yeah. of thing yeah um was that important I, I, I felt i i wanted to another one was um uh was overpopulation and that was one um because it's it's kind of been built up to be a bigger crisis than it is um yeah. but i wanted to so actually friends of the earth didn't want that in because they felt that was we didn't want to give it the time but on the other hand i said well no no you got people like david attenborough saying it is an issue um, we have to have it in there, even if it's to kind of explain, give some of the facts. So things like that, like nuclear power. And I, I don't, I honestly don't know about nuclear power. I think it's, I mean, the, the, the issue with waste is horrendous. Um, but and more even so than the disasters, because actually, if you look at health causes, like the, the, the damage to health by, by fossil fuels, it's much, much greater. Um, but I wanted, I didn't want to have definitive answers i wanted these things to be left open there and the, the, the geoengineering stuff is very iffy um but I, I just think we need to throw everything up there and see what we can do with it i suspect that some of this, the answers as i say in the book some of the answers that we come up with are going to be bonkers you know but some of them are going to work um and uh you know if you look at if you look at anything like i kind of say we kind of need to mobilize as if it's a war and if you look at some of the weird mad inventions they came up with during the war um people look and go what the hell this is just insane you know why would you why would you do it like a bouncing bomb um or all these mad inventions and yet some of them worked you know yeah. um some of the mad ideas worked um so i wanted that sense of we just have to look at, like let's just look at everything we have enough people to look at all this stuff yeah you know we have really smart people who can take some of this weird stuff and make something really you know, powerful or potential out of it. Um, so I did want that feeling of we're, we're, we're opening it up. You know, we have to look at the options. And I also think with the power with, with nuclear energy is interesting because it was such an environmental kind of enemy for so mm-hmm. long. It's very, it really gives a sense of how, how much of a crisis the, the uh, how climate change is when some of these people are turning around and going, all right, you know what, it's that important. We have to consider nuclear power. Um, yeah. so it was a really good way to illustrate how big the issue was um do you think a uh, question from the chat um do you, do you think then that we need more climate-based science fiction um uh, the it's been kind of around for a long time but is are we like focusing enough on it enough in our fiction i, I definitely i think the more stories the better. I think anybody who's writing about any potential future and isn't including climate change in the mix is just, you know, is being blind. And I say that to somebody who wrote a book called Smiling Man and Giants where the world freezes. So, you know, had I, <laughs> I'd probably taken another tack at it now, I was mm-hmm. going to rewrite it. But, um, you know, people have been writing about this stuff since, I don't know, I mean, J.J. Ballard, when did he write The Brown World? That was probably the 60s. Yeah. Um, and even before that, um, to the Kraken Rises guy who wrote um, Day of the Triffids. He wrote a book about oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, biopolar ice caps. So, I mean, people have been aware, aware of this stuff for a long time. And I think the more we accept that this is part of the future and it has to be kind of part of any story we tell about the future. Um, but at the same time, um, 
you, you kind of want different angles. You don't want everybody to be talking about. It. Like I, I've written a book that's kind of an adult book. I haven't uh, still pitching at the moment, but I didn't want to write a dystopian book. I wanted to write a book that has adapted about the world that has adapted. It's still there are still big problems, but the world took them on. Um, and I think like one of the big drivers of that is going to be um, food. We're, we're, you know, um, John Sweeney was one of the first people to talk to. He's a, he's a guy, a professor in Maynooth and um, kind of one of the foremost authorities on the subject in Ireland. And I asked when I was doing this residency, weather stations, I, I was asking people, I said I would ask everybody, um, why sh- if I don't understand, why should I care? You know, if I yeah. don't have perspective, why should I care about this uh, topic? And he was the one who gave me the best answer. And he just said, um, less land, less food, more conflict. Um, so, yeah. you know, we have, you're looking at a drought now in California and that's, they're, they're going to, if they have the same wildfires as last year or worse, that's, that's huge. And um, they burned something like 10% of all the redwoods last year, uh, which is just mind boggling. Yeah. Um, but if you can imagine those kind of fires getting into like the, the plains of crops or something like that, um, you know, that's that will be the kind of the issue that maybe turns things around and all of a sudden but i think i think the governments are coming around um you know we we have a climate bill now finally um so uh but it is it is very much you know i think all the dramatic stuff we've been seeing on television has helped in a way it's made it more real um he wrote a, uh, a question from the chat was um you wrote, you write about climate change being a wicked problem. Um, was this uh, an intentional wow, That's reference? Cara's phrase. Um, that was Cara who wrote the forward. Yeah. yeah, I mean, Cara is actually like, she's a proper scientist. <laughs> um, I think she was kind of trying, you know, she was, she was trying to make it accessible to the kids. So um, I, I don't, um, I, I see it as it is the wake of our civilization. So when we talk, I think sometimes we can tend to th- treat it as a, um, as, as we're fighting against nature, but mm-hmm. we're not. We're, we're actually, we're trying to slow our, you know, we're trying to kind of change the course of our civilization. So the stuff we're seeing out in nature is simply the, the wake, it's the result of. Um, and so I, I, but yeah, I think Carol was kind of, that was her phrase. She was kind of trying to nail down, um, find a way for kind of kids to, to kind of get their heads around it. What, what when you're, when you're like, you know, when you're reading stuff every day about climate change, like, d- do you? And when you do, like, if you do, do do you have something that you go to, to that you just, like, cling on to to give you some hope when you're feeling <clears throat> despondent? Um, I suppose it's it's the storytelling. I mean, I have to say there are a lot of, a lot of positive stories um, and people making big changes. But some of the stuff is is really, I mean, it, you know, depress you. And you, I mean, there there are people who have kind of been studying this stuff, real serious researchers who are, are suffering real depression yeah. um, and anxiety about it. And of course, a lot of kids are now as well. Um, so I think, I think in my head, it's still. I think part of me still treats it as a kind of a world building thing. Yeah. That it's still part of a bigger story, and it's. Um, I'm, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm just fascinated with so many aspects of the world. So I, I kind of, um, there's an interest there. And I think sometimes with research and scientists, they have the same thing about their thing, you know, and that's what keeps them going. Yeah. And I think it's a passion in whatever you're doing that keeps you kind of going. So um, I decided this is my thing. I write, so I'm going to write about this subject. So um, I have this book. I actually, I did this one for kids with green schools a while back we want to park back um i'm doing a school resource and i just decided that i'm making this my thing this is what i'm doing and then it kind of you know all the little other things in our life i'm going to ratchet them up a little bit at the time you know eat less meat drive a car with a smaller engine yeah. little things you can kind of keep changing all the time um but i think and people anybody i know who kind of who um as you know yourself activism empowers you you know it gives you hope and it makes you feel better so um i'm working with people and kind of dealing with working on any kind of solution helps you kind of get your head around it um but it is i mean anxiety and depression are a really big issue for this yeah i found like when the pandemic started i my initial reaction was like what can i do 
you know, it was like, uh, so I, you know, I just dived into trying to help other um, chronically ill people and disabled people as kind of a, as kind of like, as a way to be active about it. And I found that just having something to do every day was like a good way almost to process it in a way that like, there's this massive problem I can't do anything about, but I am doing something. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> and I think actually in some ways, I mean, I hate to say, you know, a, a disease that has, has killed millions of people, that there's a positive side to it, but it has shown us that our normality can change really quickly. And normality bias, this idea that everything isn't can't change, that essentially we'll have the same world in a few years or a few decades time. We now see, we have seen this full on, um, that this can change. And we also, I mean, I'd be fascinated to, f- to see how this affects kids because people growing up for instance during war will have an, an like an, uh, a hate for an enemy for a long time for a generation yeah With this time what we're seeing is company you know countries cooperating on a global scale everybody seeing like this thing's affecting everyone you know mm. so i think the the like kids my age or my kids age um or younger maybe a bit older are seeing that this is like entirely connected you know that everything we do is is kind of has reverberations has effects around the world so um and then that's i mean we you know the idea that we you know that the, again i mentioned in the book the idea that we and a vaccine that normally takes 10 years to produce was produced in a year um because one woman like one i don't know there's probably a bunch of others as well but there's a woman basically researching or an uh or an a and it was um it just happened to come along at the right time and, and who spread information around and somebody you know, worked out the genome sequence. So um, all of these things, people just said, no, 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 we just need to sort this. This is like, we can't divide on this. Um, so, I mean, the one the one thing that we really have to sort is, is kind of vaccines for, you know, getting over this whole idea of vaccines have got to be shared. We've got to get them out in the developed world. And, um, but I think as a whole, it's been extraordinary. Um, yeah. So again, it's, it's almost like this has come along the time when we need to start thinking in these terms um and uh again it's in a weird way it's it's kind of a source of hope yeah i I thought it was like it was really impressive like very quickly after after it was discovered um that the the virus was like okay we've sequenced it we're going to send that to everyone around the world and everyone's going to start working on it like yeah, immediately. Yeah. Stop yeah, what like, you're doing. <laughs> you know, forget, like drop everything. We all got to sort yeah. this. And I think, and there's been a lot of negative stuff. I mean, there's still not enough, you know, things that we've done better and we could have we could have managed it better. But you can imagine if this thing had hit 50 years ago, even, or 40 years ago, um, it would be an entirely different thing. You know, if it had hit, I mean, we saw, you know, from the, the pandemic in 1918 or, uh, yeah, 1918. Yeah. Um, that that's what would happen when we don't react the way we react now when we couldn't so um you know we have the means and there's this there's still problems we're still not getting everything right but we are getting it better um yeah. like, so we um, just need to get it better a little bit faster now we need to kind of you know get our skids on but but um the potential is there yeah it, it almost feels like we've i i when we you saw a lot of people like kind of go Oh, we can work together almost. Yeah. Um, it was, it, it's, it's really heartening, really. Um, yeah. <laughs> and you can imagine, like, you know, as I said at the, the start, where you have a species as a whole deciding we have a problem to solve and we have to solve it the whole way around the world, you know, that's, it's, it just hadn't happened before. So, um, you know, we're, we're thinking on an entirely different scale and that's hard. You know, it's 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 not going to come easy, but it, we are doing it for the first time. So, um, it's you know, we just need really at this point, we need numbers. We just need more people interested. We need more people taking part. That's that's what's going to do it. Um, do you, so? Have are you planning to to when you when you're able to go back to it? Do you think you'll be doing libraries to promote this book, or you know, with kids and stuff? Or? <laughs> Um, yeah, it's weird because we can't we can't kind of yeah. do live events at the moment. But I mean, I still do stuff on Zoom all the time. So um, yeah, I mean, it, it'll be part of the publicity for the book. You know, interviews and, and talks and stuff. And when I start doing schools and libraries again, it, yeah, it'll be on this theme. So I have my first request for libraries in the, in the autumn um, for a children's book festival. So 
um, yeah, yeah. I mean, it'll very much be, uh, you know, um, and I, there's times when I just want to go, oh, I just want to think about something else for a while. Yes. Um, <laughs> but, but uh, you know, it is what it is. That's This is my latest book, so I'll be out pushing it, you know. What, what do you go to when you need to just get away from it? Uh, oh, I don't know. I just go for a walk or I, I do a yeah. picture or something or read something light, you know, or, or work on, you know, just, yeah, just change of direction. Um, I'm trying to pay a bit, just pay a bit more attention to nature as well, you know, kind of a um, little thing like I got a picture of this, on, a little picture of this thing on the app on my phone. So I can look around, go around plants, go, what's that? I don't know what that is. What's that? You know, cool. what's paper birch? What's ground cell? You know, all these things. So, um, so yeah, yeah, I think just getting outside and, and you know, and getting, there's, there's loads of good things. There's a lot of good stuff in life. So um, I think that's, you just got to look to those, you know. Yeah, you're uh, in the book. It tr- you really emphasize getting outside as like a as a way boat to like get away from you know climate change and also to get into climate change as well. Yeah, you know, like to get away from the misery of it and actually be present in what you're talking about. Yeah, I mean, I mean, small things can have a big effect. I mean, one of the things I, go, I, I talk about in the book is that nature will fill any hole we give it. You know, and nature, letting it rewild and then kind of letting it take back some territory, is, it'll just take whatever we give it. So, I mean, it's like if you, if you, if you have a garden, if you've ever tried to weed dandelions, you'll see what nature can do. They just don't quit. You know? <laughs> or I remember one time we had, we had eight puppies, um, like our dog and puppies, and it's like, Jesus Christ, they grow so fast. How yeah. do they make this much poo? You know, it's like they just keep coming. Um, uh-huh. then, so it's it's like little things like that details and kind of in life you kind of go yeah i, I you know I, I there's a plant that, that in my driveway that grows up through tarmac you know nature's just waiting for a chance so little things like that you just think yeah you know what let's give them space and um you know give a bit more room to go yeah, my, my back garden is definitely a rewilding project at the moment. It's been <laughs> Yeah, that's grand. It's how just leave it. That's a just you know healthy yeah. biodiversity probably. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, feed the bees. <laughs> um yeah, so um this has been a really wonderful, really wonderful um talk, uh chat. And I've been re- I've really enjoyed the book and really, I would I recommend really absolutely I would recommend absolutely anybody to go out there and pick it up. Um, Little Island Books, is that the best place to get it? um, Little Island, you can get on the website, but it'll be, it's on general distribution. So your local, you know, support your local indie bookshop um, Mm -hmm. or go straight to the website. Yeah, whatever, whatever you're thinking, you know, even the evil empire, if you have to, (laughs) um, you know. Is it available in libraries as well or? um, It will be, I'm not sure how, how soon because that they, they tend to kind of do a you know yeah. they buy on tender so they kind of kind of stock up at certain points in the year um but yeah i mean it's 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 out there generally and if, if the shops don't have it you can just order oh that's great um uh thank you very much Ashin. Well, thank you very much Danielle. Yeah, no problem um and um if for anyone who is interested in octagon presents uh our next time we'll be doing found family fortunes as part of our pride programming and there is there should be a link to our survey for figuring out what our survey says in the chat um so please fill out our survey and um if you are interested we will be posting details about that very soon um Thank you once again, Oshin, and I look forward to seeing us solve climate change. <laughs> Thank you very much. Bye, Oshin.